All right. Um, yeah, so thank you very much for the invitation to present this work. And um, please, any time, feel free to jut in, to butt in with questions, comments, just unmute yourself and uh, go right away. Um, but anyways, yeah, so I'd like to today tell you about some work uh, uh, with Ning Bao and Grant Remen, who are I guess, the two representatives of the GeoFlow uh, collaboration at Berkeley. Uh, work that we uh, called Warping Wormholes with Dust, and that in the archive version of the paper, we gave the, uh, the secondary title, A Metric Construction of the Python's Lunch. But here, for the purposes of you know, a laid back, relaxed talk I'm going to call, or how to gorge your Python. All right, so let's get started here. So I'll start with a brief introduction. And so really, the result that I want to talk to you about today is really it's, it's a result of the differential geometries. Um, really, it's very much a geometric thing. Uh, but our motivation for getting there really did come from ADS-CFT, from information theoretic uh, considerations. And so I'll start with discussing, as one does with these sorts of talks, still the ADS-CFT conjecture. So for the purposes of this talk, uh, let me just remind you what I mean by the ADS-CFT uh, conjecture. By that, I mean the proposal that certain states and certain conformal field theories in the right limit are exactly in correspondence with asymptotically locally anti desider geometries. Okay, so according to this correspondence, um, if you have a ground state in the CFT, uh, this would correspond to just vacuum ADS-3 or empty ADS-3. Or the, if you take another state, such as the thermal field double, which made its appearance in the talk uh, in the previous talk, this should be dual to a single-sided black hole. Okay. So, uh, and again, I'm taking the conjectural aspect. I'm the, the conjectural aspect of the correspondence I'm taking is that really this is a correspondence not just in like the formal supergravity sense, but really between um, a much larger class of CFT, CFTs in different dimensions and asymptotically locally ADS geometries. Right. And so because this collaboration is called GeoFlow, um, certainly for me personally, why this corresponds is very interesting is because it, give, it establishes a connection between geometry and information. Uh, namely, certain, according to this correspondence, certain information theoretic quantities in the conformal field theory end up being computed by geometric quantities on the gravity side, on the ADS side. Okay. And Arguably, the most uh, uh, the most prototypical entry uh, in this dictionary relating info quantities to geometric quantities is the Ryutake Nagi formula, which says that okay, if we take if we have some state of a CFT, all right, that's dual to an ADS geometry, and we take uh, some subregion of that CFT that I'm called capital A, and we look at the von Neumann entropy of the reduced state on A, then the Ryutake Nagi formula tells you that the von Neumann entropy of this reduced state is computed by the area of the extreme surface a tilde, that's a tilde that's homologous to the boundary region A in Planck units, okay, plus order one corrections. Right, so this is really like the, it, it's a foundational piece of this geometric information connection. Now, the, uh, the foundation is just one part of the edifice that is currently being built. And so there's, of course, uh, this is being extended in many ways, and there's many other uh, information geometric connections that have been uh, established. So just to name a few, there's general generalizations of the Ryutake Nagi formula. You can go to the covariant settings where uh, this tells you how to compute one on entropy in a, uh, a time-dependent setting. Uh, you can start looking at subleading corrections to uh, the Ryutake Nagi formula where, okay, we look at um, instead of extremizing just area, we start extremizing uh, generalized entropy, so an area term plus a bulk entropy term, term, and this has gained a lot of, uh, or has been very important recently in a lot of these discussions about uh, entangled islands and replica wormholes. Um, or we can start doing other things. So we don't have to just look at entangled entropy. We can look at other entropic measure, measures, such as uh, entanglement of purification or multipartite versions of entanglement of purification, um, which I won't dwell too much on, but it's a personal interest of mine. And for those in the, in the know, you can go, aha, I like that. Um, and right, and we've also got a huge amount of mileage out of uh, correspondences between tensor networks and, um, or rather, tensor network descriptions of conformal holographic conformal the field theories that illustrate some of these geometric features of um, um, that geometrize some of the uh, information theoretic aspects of the CFT. Uh, right, but anyways, so 
really though, this talk, what I'd eventually like to get to is um, a new class of asymptotic ADS solutions in two plus one dimensions. Okay, so um, there's the information side on the CFT and there's also the geometric side. And kind of this work really, si it really sits on, well, the geometric side in uh, driving new exact solutions in ADS. Okay, and uh, so we've derived one new class of um, uh, asymptotic ADS solutions in two plus one dimensions that contain pressureless dust. Okay, um, so you have exact analytic control over them. There's a customizable density distribution um, of the dust in your space time. And what's kind of neat is that you can take these, uh, you can take these space times if you tune the dust distribution the right way. Uh, you can play games where you start cutting and pasting. Uh, slices of the space-time to full, to make very irregular wormholes. Okay, so before moving on to our actual to our actual construction, because it's, it's actually fairly quick to just to describe what the construction is, um, I thought I'd spend a little bit more time just drawing on background um, and giving a bit more motivation for like, okay, well, why why would you want to in the first place even make some of these these irregular and bulging wormholes? And the motivation that you might have in mind for doing that uh, would come from holographic complexity, okay? So, okay, before we get to holographic complexity, let's just start with regular complexity, all right? So, as a definition, suppose you're given some reference state, which I'm gonna call psi naught in Hilbert space H, uh, some set of unitary operations, uh, u1, u2, dot, 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 okay, that you're allowed to perform, and uh, some tolerance, so some small number epsilon, then we can define the gate complexity of a different state psi in the Hilbert space H as the minimum number of unitaries that you have to draw from uh, the set of unitaries that you're allowed to use such that when you apply them to your reference state, uh, you get very close to your target state, okay? So the distance between your target state and this approximate version of it that you constructed is very small, okay? And very roughly, uh, very roughly you can think of complexity as um, quantify the difficulty of performing some computational task, okay? So if you had a quantum computer, it just, you'd be the number of gates you'd have to use to perform your computation. Right, so complexity, um, it has participated in the uh, quantum and gravity discussion for a long time, over the, certainly over the last decade. And one of the earliest, uh, uh, or yeah, I think one of the earlier um, uh, places where com kind of complexity entered the gravity discussion uh, was in the proposal of Harlow and Hayden, uh, where, so they, where they proposed that distilling, Hawking, uh, distilling information from Hawking radiation is a very complex, a very hard thing to do. Okay, so in their proposal, what you do is you have an evaporating black hole and uh, so you, this black hole has been emitting radiation for some time. It's out there uh, in, in a cloud that is being collected by uh, the observer who's going to do some information processing on this thing. And their task is, um, is to now take uh, uh, an outgoing uh, qubit of Hawking radiation that's coming from the black hole and distill from that qubit the radiation they've collected so far, um, uh, distill a bell pair, okay? Um, I see. I see the chat blinking. Uh, I don't think it's a question for me, but I'll ask if I'll ask if there is a question. I'm just going to ignore what's happening in the chat, and I'll ask that if there is a question that whoever has it just speak up and interrupt me. Right. So right. So what Harlan Hayden found, or they argued for, is that um, distilling information from Hawking radiation should be a very complex task. Okay. Okay. Good. So that's early appearance of complexity in the quantum gravity discussion. Uh, more recently, um, complexity has shown up in holography, in ADS-CFT, uh, in a proposal of Brown, Roberts, Susskind, Swingle, and Zhao, um, where, according to this proposal, uh, the complexity of a holographic CFT state is given by a measure of the corresponding space-time region, okay? Um, so again, you'll excuse me if I make any mistakes. I'm not an expert in this uh, area, and so I'm not uh, fully up to date you know, on what is, uh, what is the cutting edge, uh, which proposal is uh, favored, whether it's complexity is equal to action of the wheel or patch, so this, the, the space-time region anchored at uh, the two points on these boundary CFTs, or whether uh, the complexity equal vo equals volume proposal, so that roughly the complexity of the state should be equal to 
um, the volume of, of an extremal space like slice, so that goes like the normal volume, which one is favored or more attractive right now. But either way, um, the proposal is that complexity in the holographic CFT is dual to a measure of, a, of the corresponding space-time region in the ADS bulk. Okay. In any case, though, there seems to be then some tension between these two proposals. So on one hand, um, Harlan and Hayden, they say that, okay, well, distilling, uh, a uh, distilling a bell pair from Hawking radiation is uh, very complex. It's, it's exponential in the black hole entropy. Uh, and in the picture where you have a, uh, ha where you have two CFT, two coupled CFTs in some black hole state, um, the corresponding question is, okay, well, um, distilling, uh, dis distilling a bell pair uh, across the two CFTs. And we certainly know that it's possible to write down uh, entangled states across the two CFTs that have a holographic description as a two-sided black hole, for which the pattern of entanglement is, uh, well, fairly simple, at least relatively simple, compared to the complexity, uh, the complexity professed by Harlan um, and Hayden. Um, and so we have this tension between these uh, these two pr proposals for what complexity should be. So according to Harlan and Hayden, uh, this is something that's exponentially complex in the beckinstein hawking entropy. According to BRS has said, it's only polynomial complex. So what gives? What's the resolution? And the, res res the resolution uh, that, are, that I've seen appear in the literature in the Python's lunch, which I'll get to in the next slide, is that these uh, really are referring to different types of complexity. Okay, so namely the complexity that Harlow and Hayden are talking about is a restricted complexity where uh, your aim is to decode a bell pair from the Hawking radiation or a bell pair across the two sides of the CFT, but you're only allowed to perform local gates. Okay, so gates of the form U left tensor U right. Whereas the complexity referred to at by BRSS, uh, I think that's a typo. Yes, there should only be two S's, BRS has said, is an unrestricted complexity where gates, uh, where arbitrary gates uh, coupled across both CFTs are allowed. Okay, so arbit arbitrary gates to the form, uh, well, maybe not arbitrary, but a couple of gates to the form ULR are allowed. Okay. And for me, um, this Python's lunch proposal of Brown, Haribian, uh, Pennington, and Seskind is a very stark geometric intuition to illustrate um, this difference in complexity. Okay. And so let me put it this way. So the, the intuition I draw from this is that um, you, one can construct, or I will show you that one can construct uh, wormholes as such, which, uh, so you have the wormhole, the throat narrowing from the asymptotically ADS region, uh, narrows into a throat region and bulges out in the middle. The idea is that this bulging region in here uh, should be very difficult to access with um, polynomial numbers of simple single-sided operations, okay? Um, if you want some geometric intuition for that, uh, the, ge the geometric intuition that I have in mind is that these minimal surfaces, I mean, if we think of probing this bulk space-time with uh, uh, boundary-anchored probes and simple operations that don't back-react too much on the geometry, then you're really going to need a huge amount of these operations before you significantly start back-reacting on this geometry, enough that you can, so that you can see into this bulging region. All right, good. Um, so, right, so that's the Python's lunch, and in the rest of this paper, uh, what I'd like to do now is describe, okay, well, go back to uh, this proposed, our proposal, how do you, uh, what are this, what is this new class of asymptotic radius space size of dust, and how do you, uh, how do you construct bulging wormholes uh, like this uh, from our construction? So that's all I want to say for a motivation introduction. Are there any questions? Going once, going twice. All right, if not, I will continue then. So let's recall some facts about ADS in three dimensions. So with the right choice of coordinate system, uh, I can take an empty ADS and draw it as a cylinder, as I've shown here on the slide. So we have time running in the vertical direction and the um, ADS bulk on the inside of the cylinder. And for reasons of convenience, I'm going to work in the Poincaré patch, which uh, is not the full, a, the full uh, ADS3 manifold. It's this, um, this region I've shaded uh, in green, but 
it's okay. I mean, you can you can go to the full ADS manifold if you want. It won't really change much. This is, the analysis is just much easier in the point Kelly patch. And in fact, for constructing the wormhole, we're really just going to dwell on the t equal zero slice switch. So I've drawn this t equal zero slice here, and really, um, I'm, it's going to be most convenient to actually work in planar point Kelly coordinates. So um, if you're not if you're not extremely familiar with this, uh, I'm so, sorry for blazing through it really quickly, but you can just think of taking this disk, uh, making a little incision right here, and unwrapping that boundary uh, to form this uh, uh, this x-axis here. And I've sketched what various curves look like once you take this t equals zero slice and wrap it into the Poincaré plane. And if you dabbled on ads I mean, you've probably seen this metric floating around. It's it's the one we know and love. It's easy, it's simple to write down. Okay, um, great. Now, why I went through the exercise of writing down this metric is because it's the starting point for our onsets for an ADS spacetime with pressureless dust. So in particular, uh, what we found, certainly thanks to uh, a lot of uh, very clever and heroic trial and, effort, trial and error by Grant Renan, uh, is that the follow, so this metric that you write down here, which looks a lot like just the ADS metric in uh, Poincare, planar Poincaré coordinates, except we have this little warp factor, this um, uh, hyperbolic secant warp factor and uh, this uh, f of x z warp factor uh, in in the uh, spatial coordinates. If you take this on SOTS, it gives you a stress energy tensor um, that only has a TT component of rho and all the other components are zero once you subtract off the um, negative cosmological constant contribution. Okay, so it gives you uh, an asymptotically ADS metric that contains pressureless dust and the energy density of the dust uh, is, given, is uh, given by the following expression here, okay? So it's dictated by this function f of x and z. And so it's kind of cool because in principle what this does is lets you, uh, it lets you really specify whatever uh, dust uh, distribu distribution you want. The only price you have to pay is you just have to solve this differential equation for f of x and z, okay? And um, if you are paying particularly close attention, or you are very much a relativist at heart, you'll notice that these are not quite the same as the Planck alley coordinates I showed you on the previous slide. Um, it's a fairly straightforward coordinate transformation to get back to the uh, usual, or to coordinates that agree everywhere with the Planck alley coordinates. But in particular, uh, these systems of coordinates agree on the uh, t equals zero slice. Okay, so we have ADS plus dust. So what, so what does it do? Um, well, it does, basically what you'd expect to do from gravitation. So uh, we can, uh, um, for certain nice choices of the dust density, you can uh, analytically, you can basically analytically do everything. You can look at what geodesics look like in the presence of this dust and dust. And as you'd expect, um, once you start introducing dust into your space time, uh, you pay a price in distance for traversing the dust. And so your geodesics tend to stray away from the dust. They want to minimize the amount of time they spend in this dust. And so what I'm showing you here is two plots in this first plot. Um, we just, so we've anchored a family of geodesics to the same fixed boundary points. And I'm showing you how these geodesics behave. Uh, so in red is no dust at all. And then how they start bending away, uh, trying to get out of the dusty region as you make the dust uh, denser and denser and denser going down. And likewise, this next plot here is just showing you how the geodesics behave when you start enlarging the size of boundary regions. So you're forcing more of the geodesic to go into the dust. Still, it wants to flatten out and try and get away um, from the dusty region. Okay, great, so cool. New class of exact solutions uh, to ADS3. So what then, so now I'll start moving towards talking about warped wormholes. What might you want to do with uh, exact solutions? So of course, if you're an information theorist or in, you're information theoretically inclined, uh, you, could do, you could start computing entropic things like, well, okay, I say entropic, but really I mean the geometric analog of the entropic quantity if it were um, if it had a CFT dual. So you could compute things like art entropies, or in this case, RT services. You can compute things like neutral informations. You could compute things like entanglement wedge cross section, which again, if uh, um, you're interested in entanglement purification of these measures, that is um, an interesting essay to perform. Um, or what you can do, which is what I'd like to uh, flash in the rest of this talk and show some nice uh, fancy pictures, um, is you can cut and paste along geodesics to make wormholes. So um, how do you do that? So you take the t equals zero slice of the geometry and 
in order that we can cut and paste smoothly, uh, let's take our, our dust distribution, rho of x and z, and choose it such that is such that it is, it is reflection symmetric in uh, the z-axis. Okay, so choosing rho of x z equals rho of minus x z will ensure that the room is smooth. All right, um, then what you can do is, if we look at this picture, you can cut along these two geodesics, gamma one and gamma two, and glue them together. Okay, so what we're doing, so in the next slide, you'll see the result of this. What we're doing is we're get one uh, mouth of the geodesic is going to become this region A. The other mouth, uh, the other, sorry, one mouth of the wormhole is going to become this region A. The other mouth of the wormhole will become this region B. And so these points will become identified. These points will become identified. The whole thing will get wrapped up. And one, what you wind up with is, well, yeah, you wind up with a um, Riemannian slice of a space-time that contains an einstein rosen bridge, a wormhole, okay? So, um, again, if we take a particularly simple um, distribution for your dust, so in this case, just a step function where you have vacuum up to some depth and then now you have a space-time filled with dust, um, you can make wormholes that deviate from the uh, from the case of empty ADS. So in this case, all the, what this does to do is it just thickens the wormhole, fattens it up. So you can see the empty EDS case on the inside and the fattened case on the outside. Um, but then if you're a little bit bold and uh, uh, you stray away from the uh, totally uh, the totally analytically tractable um, situations, you can start making fancier wormholes. So uh, an example of another wormhole that you can build is a Python's lunch geometry. So one of these wormholes that bulges in the middle. So for that, um, uh, right, I don't have much better reason for choosing this uh, metric parameter f of x z, which gives a rather nasty distribution of your dust. Uh, the the best reason I can give for you is that okay, this is like a this is a rather simple metric parameter that you can uh, feed into the metric that still gives you positive energy density everywhere. Because remember, you can't specify the energy density directly; you have to do it by solving differential equation, and so it just turns out this is a very convenient onset. Um, but right, but what it does is then when you cut and paste and fold up, um, uh, fold up this uh, the spatial slice, it gives you this bulging wormhole. Okay, so again, it's it's non-trivial to to make sure that the energy density rho is greater than zero everywhere, which is why you can't just um, if you try uh, what you think would give you reasonable distribution, distribution, you might fail. Um, but again, in principle, you can have whatever dust distribution you want by numerically solving, if needed, well, if needed numerically, solving the ordinary differ differential equation for f given an arbitrary density rho. And I say that you can do that because, in fact, you yourself can, if you would like to. Uh, you can try making your, worm, your own wormhole if you want. Um, I invite you, if you're interested, to go to the archive supplemental materials, download Mathematica code, and just uh, yeah, plug and play, plug and chug, and see what uh, see what wormholes uh, you can come up with. But again, the intuition again, the intuition is very is very clear um, relativistic intuition. What's happening here is just you you have this you have this um, if we imagine so what, what we're plotting here the surface of resolution revolution um, is just the uh, the radius of that surface is the length of the GDs connecting points on gamma one and gamma two. And again, the intuition is just that as you move in from the boundary initially that width is decreasing, but eventually your GDs are going they're, they're going to try to avoid this little lump of dust in the middle as much as they can. But eventually they're going to be forced to run through it, and that's going to cause the length of your GDs to grow again, which then produces that bulge. But then once they can get past that dust again, it'll start shrinking again before. Uh, they, before it again flares out as you have more and more of the geodesic, uh, well, as you have the geodesic getting longer and longer and longer as approaches the boundary of your cut and paste region. Okay. So I think that's pretty much all I wanted to say. So I'll just wrap up in the last slide with a summary of what we did and then invite questions if there are any. So again, so just to summarize uh, in this nice little, this little cute work that we put together, we. Uh, uh, found a new class of asymptotically ADS metrics in two plus one dimensions that have a customizable density of dust. Okay, so this represents a fairly large new class of exact solutions to three dimensional ADS uh, gravity. Okay, and what's kind of cool, um, and one of the original reasons why we went about and did this is because you can take these geometries, you can take slices of them, uh, you can cut and paste them, and what you wind up with are warped wormholes, including. Uh, these uh, Python's lunches wormholes that have appeared in the discussion of uh, holographic complexity in ADS-CFD. 
So to end, I'll just put, I'll just I'll end on a couple of questions uh, that one might consider in the future, such as, well, okay, could you get better parametric control over these normal properties? Um, uh, I guess if you are a whiz at different uh, at ordinary differential equations, you might uh, uh, you might be able to extract some more meaningful parametric information out of the ODE governing the relationship between the metric parameter and the density. And uh, perhaps, but more importantly, it will, uh, it would be possible to construct CFT duals to these solutions. Um, or can we even extract property, uh, what, what would be the right CFT properties um, for any purported dual to these solutions? Can we extract this from the geometric information that we have? And uh, yeah, so I think that's all. I think I'll just end here um, and I'll take any questions if there are. And uh, either way, I invite you, if you're so inclined to make your own wormholes by Disney the archive page and uh, download the Mathematica code. So yeah, that's it. Thank you for your attention, and uh, I'll end there. Well, thank you. Um, so questions? Yeah, I have a comment more than a question. It'd be weird if I asked a question. But I, was uh, say, I don't. I don't think you get to ask questions, Ning, because you're an author on this paper. So. Wow. Yeah. But but my, my <laughs> I had a comment, which is uh, one thing that it might also be useful to think about in the future, which is particularly relevant to Python's lunch geometries, is if you constrain yourself to only metrics that you can construct in this pressureless dust way, it would be interesting to figure out if there was like a, an upper bound on the size of the bulb that you could generate in this way. Because uh, in the Python's lunch geometry, mm -hmm. you understand correctly, you kind of want the intermediate expression swell governed by the size of the bulb to be in some sense exponentially big. And that's the thing that kind of drives the difference between the restricted and unrestricted complexities. So it'd be interesting as uh, further work in this direction to see if there actually is a bulk gravitational solution for which the bulge can be made exponentially larger than the... Um, so maybe that's related to my question. Um, mm -hmm. I want to ask, uh, so so does, does the Python lunch discussion, does that suggest that if you look at these solutions with the Python lunch part and without, like the wormhole with, with the big uh, middle part or not, if you convert your, your result, I mean, tuning your F function to reach the, to realize these two cases, do you really see uh, uh, any qualitative difference? I mean, like, naively, I can just tune the function to gradually deform one to the other, so, I don't know how to see that one is more complex than the other. Um, yeah, so again, is there like a topological change of uh, some RT service? Uh, so uh, certainly, I guess so. In the case where there is no no bulge, there is just there's a single unambiguous RT surface. It's just the the throat of the wormhole. And now, as you um, as you uh, grow the bulge in the wormhole, then you, know, you can imagine this. You can imagine like an elastic band uh, around this wormhole throat. And as you start growing the bulge, this band is going to slip to one of the sides. And okay, if you do, if you tune your dust density asymmetrically, um, then one of the throats is going to be the smallest throat, the band will like slip to that throat. I imagine you can engineer situations where I mean, you grow the bulge while keeping the external throats the same size. Um, I guess I can't really, I can't say much more about how it would conform, how it would inform the complexity discussion, I guess beyond what the comment that Ning already made, which is that um, ultimately, like the relevant question is going to be the ratio between these, uh, between the sizes of like this, the inner bulge and these outer throats. Can I ask a question? Yes, yes, please. I, I guess it's just a follow up on this. I, I mean, there should be a way if if the proposal is right, and I think there's a huge amount of evidence for it. Um, there should be a way of formulating a problem that's analogous, uh, you know, in the original two sided black hole case to saying you have access only to one side or you have access to both sides. And you know, what is the computational problem on the boundary side that is made hard when, when you add a bulge to your geometries? I, th I think that would be really interesting. There must, there, must be an, there must be such a problem. Yeah, I mean, I think that the natural answer, well, a natural answer to that question is the, is the entanglement cost of preparing the state. <clears throat> 
So like the distillable entanglement between the two sides will just be given by the entanglement entropy of the two things. So that might not change. But you might imagine that if I invert the question, if I ask how many bell pairs do I need in order to create the state, then for a state with a larger bulge, I would require more bell pairs. And so uh, you might imagine that you can perform that calculation for a simple thermofield double state and find an answer. And then if you introduce these bulk geometries and you ask what is the entanglement cost of creating that state, that would be a different larger number. Though answering that question would probably require an answer to one of the open questions in Aiden's last slide, which is what are exactly the CFD duals of the state for these geometries? I mean, I guess in looking at the two talks so far, I'm, I'm curious whether you know, the Python's lunch could be the next, uh, you know, testing scrambling through teleportation, uh, give, give, giving Chris something yeah. to do, uh, as, yeah. as, especially, you know, in light, of, in light of Lenny's comment that we don't really, sometimes we don't even want that many qubits. Um, I mean, ex extremely high complexity of, of reconstruction is something we could only test with a few qubits, presumably for the sort of by definition. Yeah, and I guess at least like if we, um, I mean, if you go back and, and look at the Python's lunch uh, paper and look at like some of these constructions discussed in there, at least or rather the tensor network models is discussed in there, it suggests that like, okay, the right way to start preparing these states are these networks that do literally have these like bulges in the network and that come back out. Um, so I don't, I, I don't know what that ultimately means for the CFT uh, state itself, but yeah, I can imagine that it is the sort of thing where you might be able to, um, to build a like, small number of qubit versions of these Python launch constructions, or at least kind of get at these, get at the, the, the relevant information theoretic aspects of the constructions with a small number of qubits. Is, it, um, is that true that um, um, if you make a bulge uh, large and larger and larger, mm -hmm. the operation you need for the teleportation to complete would be, you know, just not the simple EPR projection, but it become more and more you know, exponentially complex as a, as a relative size of the of the area of the bottleneck and and then uh, middle center it, and just check experimentally that uh, yes I, I i imagine that would be a case because i i imagine that would be a case where you really are increase well Yes, depending on the resources that you're given access to, but I, I think that means that this is a case where you really are driving up in a huge way the uh, restricted complexity. Um, and please, any, any, any experts, that certainly I see there's also authors of the, uh, of the Python's lunch paper in uh, the audience, so please correct me if I'm wrong. But yeah, so uh, my understanding that would really drive up the unrestricted complexity. So if you're trying to do teleportation where you're only non-local resources a shared entanglement, then yeah, I imagine that would Right, that would, that would drive up the complexity of your teleportation operation, what you have to do in a single-sided way. Yeah, my, my worry is that, the, in, that if, in that very simple few qubit experiment, you're not really using your geometry. It's just a general analysis of quantum information, but still. Yeah, I, I, and I guess, okay, maybe waxing, waxing philosophical here, but it's a, uh, it's, it's a question too of like, okay, well, how, do you want to think of it as like we're geometrizing quantum information or using information to understand gravity? And so like, in the sense, maybe what you're suggesting is that, yeah, this is like a, uh, we're understanding a general quantum information phenomenon in terms of geometrization. But, mm -hmm. We could always, we could also do it backwards um, in, in the following sense where we can just make the bulk geometry in this way. And then we can try to build a tensor network representation of the bulk geometry and design the circuit that's supposed to do the thing based on that tensor network geometry. So in that sense, you build a tensor network that's inherently faithful to the bulk geometry that you have instead of a tensor network that maybe just resembles the bulk geometry that you have. And then you're kind of guaranteed to have a faithful result. Okay, um, so I guess we should probably uh, Move on. Uh, thanks, Aidan, again for 